This morning we are beginning a new series of studies. I'd like to devote uh, several weeks in this idea of the person and work of the Holy Spirit. Now, one key to being an effective evangelist or speaker is being innovative. Uh, sometimes you need to be downright imaginative. And I think the Apostle Paul certainly fit this description. He would often use objects familiar to his audience in order to get across a spiritual truth, much like Jesus did with his parables. And we see an example of this in Acts chapter 17. Paul is in the city of Athens, and Athens was a, a university city. It was a city known for its philosophers and for its learning, but it was also a place of great idol worship. And we read earlier in this chapter that Paul was disturbed as he saw all of these idol temples, all of these altars that were uh, devoted to one god or goddess uh, or another. But when he had a chance to speak to the people, beginning in verse 22, Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. Now what you worship is something unknown, I am going to proclaim to you. And of course, he went on to preach the gospel of Jesus. Now, we shake our heads and chuckle at the thought of worshiping an unknown God. I mean, how silly is that? But I wonder if many of us Bible-believing Christians are not, in fact, doing much the same thing. Michael Green writes, The Christian church has always had a good many professing members who know about as much of the Holy Spirit as the, in their experience as those disciples at Ephesus who were asked by Paul, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we've not even heard there is a Holy Spirit. Many churchmen of all denominations have been in the same state. They've heard in a vague way about the Holy Spirit, but have either put it all down to typical church talk or assumed that it was not intended for ordinary folks like themselves. For all practical purposes, the Holy Spirit could be discounted. I would suggest to you that the Holy Spirit is the unknown God to many Christians. We just don't know a whole lot about him. To most folks, the person, the work, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is a mystery. He's not only invisible, but also confusing. Maybe even a little bit eerie. I mean, those of us who grew up uh, under the King James Version referred to him as the Holy Ghost, right? A little spooky, maybe. Sometimes he's referred to as it. And it's not an it. It's a he. He's a person. And he is very much a part of the Godhead. Now, why? Why is this the case? Well, I believe this distant stance many have taken regarding the Holy Spirit is the result of an overreaction. Uh, I mentioned a few weeks ago about the pendulum. You know how pendulums swing back and forth? And I mentioned that we tend to do that as a culture. We also tend to do that as a church. And this pendulum swings. Some will only focus on the Holy Spirit as though he was the only member of the Godhead or certainly the most important. And then in reaction to that, some go all the way to the other extreme almost to ignore him altogether. I think both extremes are wrong. The Holy Spirit is one member of the Godhead, meaning he is fully God. He has a distinct personality, and he has a function. And he is at work in our world. And yet some of our churches try to ignore the Holy Spirit because of the extreme some have taken. I have even known of pastors and churches that will not sing hymns in the hymnal that are addressed to the Holy Spirit. I've had one pastor tell me the Holy Spirit should not be worshipped. I said, really? Isn't he God? 
as God, he is meant to be worshipped. So I want to avoid either extreme. I don't want to overemphasize the person and work of the Holy Spirit, but I don't want to ignore him either. I want to see what the Bible has to say, and not only how he works in the church setting, but how he works in our individual lives. Uh, Some are scared when the whole idea of of Pentecostal or charismatic Christians come up. I I had an elder in one church, not this one, said if someone started speaking in tongues, I'd pick them up and throw them out the door. And he was big enough to do it. (laughs) I don't think we need to go to that reaction. We don't have to go to that extreme. But then you have people on the other side that say, if you haven't spoken in tongues, you don't have the Holy Spirit. Well, folks, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not saved. And you are hard-pressed. In fact, I would defy anybody to prove to me from Scripture where you have to speak in tongues in order to have the Holy Spirit or to be saved. It's not there. So you have these two extremes that we need to avoid to have a balanced biblical view of who the Holy Spirit is. Chuck Swindoll writes in his book, Flying Closer to the Flame, During my growing up years, including my years in seminary, I kept a safe distance. I was taught to be careful, to study the Holy Spirit from a doctrinal distance, but not to enter into any of the realms of his supernatural workings or to tolerate the possibility of such. Explaining the Spirit was acceptable and encouraged. Experiencing him was neither. Today I regret that. I've lived long enough and ministered broadly enough to realize that flying closer to the flame is not only possible, but precisely what God wants. And that's my invitation through these studies. Let's draw close to the Holy Spirit. Let's understand him better, but not just so that our minds may be informed, but that we might experience his work in our lives that we might appreciate things that he does and that only he does. And I think that we will be stronger individually and a stronger church for it. Now, let me say at the very beginning of this series that everything you are about to hear is for every Christian. Sometimes we distinguish between those who are Christians and those who are spirit-filled or uh, they've really got the Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in the heart of every believer from the moment of salvation. You don't need a secondary experience. You don't need to ask Him to come in if you've already accepted Christ. He's there. We don't need to ask for the Holy Spirit to be in our presence when we gather to worship. It's all I can do not to laugh out loud when I hear somebody pray, Oh God, descend upon us and be with us in our service. He's already here, folks. (laughs) He's in our presence. Our problem is we don't acknowledge him. We don't recognize him. It's not that he's absent. We just fail to acknowledge him. There's no such thing as a super saint. There isn't. Not pastors, not missionaries, not... uh, Bible scholars and theologians or anything like that. We are all people. We're all human beings. And every person who takes the name of Jesus Christ has every bit as much of the Holy Spirit as anybody else. John Stott writes, The Christian life is life in the Spirit. It would be impossible to be a Christian, let alone to live and to grow as a Christian without the ministry of the gracious Spirit of God. All we have and are as Christians, we owe to Him. And we're going to see how He works in our lives and how He wants to work in our lives. I think the problem is not so much how much of the Holy Spirit do I have, it's how much of me does He have. And as we come to acknowledge his presence and and allow him to control us, we're going to see changes in our lives. And this idea of the Holy Spirit is not an elective course in the Christian life. This is a required, required reading and required experience. We need to know the truth. We need to break through 
the apprehension and suspicion that maybe we have uh, built around him. We need to get back to what the Bible has to say. And we need to go beyond the theory. We need to go beyond the theology. Our focus must be on practical living. Since the Spirit of God was sent not only to be studied, but ultimately to be experienced, it seems that we have stopped short of God's intended purpose if we only de discuss and debate His presence instead of exalting in Him on an intimate basis. So I want to begin to e examine, but also experience, the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. First of all, the Holy Spirit is a divine power to be appropriated. Throughout the Old and New Testaments, the words spirit and power often go together. We're going to look into this much more in detail next Sunday. You really find this true in the life of Jesus. From the beginning Throughout his earthly life and ministry, the Son of God was empowered by the Spirit of God. Even before he was born, this was evident, as seen in Gabriel's words to Mary in Luke 1.35, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Now, how did the miracle of Jesus' conception happen? It's through the power of the Holy Spirit. That first phrase should not be understood that the Holy Spirit and the power of the Most High are two distinct things. In Hebrew parallelism, Gabriel saying the same thing with different words. The Holy Spirit is the power of the Most High. And that word overshadow is the same word used to describe the presence of God in the Holy of Holies in the temple. Jesus was born in the power of the Spirit. Furthermore, Jesus lived in the power of the Spirit. In Luke 4.14, we read, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. Peter stated in Acts 10.38 how God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. So Jesus lived day to day in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus also rose again in the power of the Spirit. Paul writes in Ephesians 1, I keep asking the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for those of us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him in the right hand of the heavenly realms. Now that word, the Greek word that's translated power in that passage is the Greek word dunamis. That might not mean anything to you, but it's the word from which we get dynamite. It's that kind of explosive power that brought Jesus back from the dead. Greek scholar Kenneth Wiest points out the word in the Greek means power in the sense of overcoming resistance. Our English word dynamite comes from this Greek word. The gospel is God's spiritual dynamite which breaks the granite-like heart of the sinner into rock dust, pulverizing it so that it becomes rich soil in which the seed of the word finds root and grows. The gospel is the most powerful thing in the whole world. When it is unloosed in the spirit-empowering preaching of the word, souls are saved. Now I want you to realize or notice that Paul says the power of the Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power working in us today. Later in the same letter to the Ephesians, we read in chapter 3 verse 16, Paul says, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being." so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. There's that word again. Dynamic, 
dynamite-like power. Now, what does the power of the Spirit enable us to do? I'd just like to share a couple this morning. First, he empowers us to share Christ with others. Jesus told his disciples in Acts 1.8, you will receive what? Power. When? When the Holy Spirit comes on you. And what happens? And you will be my witnesses. So the power of the Holy Spirit enables us to share the gospel with those who need it. And what happened on the day of Pentecost? The Spirit of God came upon them and they had power. They spoke boldly. And their message bore results. In Romans 8, verses 26 and 27, we see the Spirit gives us the power to pray. It says, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. Have you ever had a situation where you know you need to pray, you know that God needs to enter into this situation and do something, but you're not sure how to pray? You're not sure whether to pray for healing or for comfort or what? (laughs) This tells us that the Holy Spirit, who understands the will of God, will pray on our behalf. In essence, He prays through us so that when we say, Lord, I don't know what the right thing is here, but your will be done, the Spirit of God takes that prayer and puts it in the right words. (laughs) He intercedes on our behalf. He gives us the power to pray. And then the Spirit gives us power over Satan. A verse I learned as a child and is always meant a lot to me is 1 John 4, 4. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Well, who is the one in you? It's the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God is greater than he that is in the world. We have power over the devil because of the Spirit of God. And what was true back in the New Testament times is still true today. Nothing has changed. It is the same God. It is the same Holy Spirit. The same power that flowed through their lives that's flowing through us today. We just need to acknowledge it. We need to appropriate it. We need to activate it in our lives. But there's more. Not only is the Holy Spirit a divine power to be appropriated, he is a divine person to be appreciated. British preacher R.A. Torrey wrote, A frequent source of error and fanaticism about the work of the Holy Spirit is the attempt to understand and study his work without, first of all, coming to know him as a person. And it's here where some cults are guilty of doctrinal error. The Jehovah Witnesses believe the Holy Spirit is neither God nor a person, according to the Watchtower teaching. It is simply an impersonal, active force that God uses in doing His will. So they deny that the Holy Spirit is even a person. Yet Jesus repeatedly refers to the Holy Spirit as He, a person of the Trinity, not an it. He is a person. Put that down in capital letters, that the Holy Spirit is not only a being having another mode of existence, He Himself is a person with all the qualities and the powers of personality. He's not just matter, He is substance. The Holy Spirit is often thought of as that wind that blows across the church. But if you think of the Holy Spirit only as a wind, a breath, you might think of Him as non-personal a non-individual, but the Holy Spirit has will, has intelligence, has emotions, has knowledge, has the ability to love and to see and to think and to hear and to speak, just like any person has. How do we know this? Well, look at the Word. 
In 1 Corinthians 2, verses 10 and 11, the New Living Translation puts it this way, It was to us that God revealed these things by His Spirit. For His Spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. No one can know a person's thoughts except that person's own spirit, and no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. So you see, the Holy Spirit has a mind. He has an intellect. Over in Ephesians 4.30, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit for whom you were sealed to the day of redemption. You see that the Holy Spirit has feelings, has emotions. Can you say that of a force? I mean, really, can gravity be grieved? Can electricity be elated? Of course not. Only a person with personality can experience those emotions, and the Spirit of God does. We also read in 1 Corinthians 12, 11, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. Now we see that the Spirit of God has a will. He has a volition. All of these things speak to the fact that He is a person. Not a force, not a thing, not an it. He is a person. Well, that's what He is. Now, who is He? The church throughout history has declared the Holy Spirit is God. All the way back in the Nicene Creed, I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, which proceedeth from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified. Holy Spirit is totally, 100% divine. He is God. And He is to be worshipped. He is to be glorified. We cannot ignore Him. And it is of the highest importance from the standpoint of worship that we decide the Holy Spirit is a divine person worthy to receive our adoration, our faith, our love, our entire surrender to Himself. When we come to that complete understanding, then we can experience Him. We can relate to Him. We can indeed have a relationship with Him. Throughout the scriptures, there are many examples, I won't go into them all today, but where the Holy Spirit is linked with the Father and the Son as God. Maybe the greatest example of that is in the Great Commission, where Jesus told his disciples to baptize in the name, singular, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In those days, you were baptized in the name of your God. And he did not just say the Father. He did not just say himself as the Son. He included the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit indeed is God. Now, as I bring this message to a close, I want to move beyond just the facts, you might say, and into living. We have considered the question, who is the Holy Spirit? We've seen that he's a divine power to be appropriated. He's a divine person to be appreciated. But as I conclude, I want to ask one more question. Who is the Holy Spirit to you? We've seen who he is in general, but who is he to you? I'm not asking for your doctrinal belief on the third person of the Trinity. I'm asking who is the Holy Spirit in your life? We may know about some famous or historical person, but that doesn't know we know him or her. I'm afraid Tozer is accurate when he writes about the doctrine of the Spirit. Evangelical Christianity believes it, but nobody experiences it. It lies under the snow, forgotten. I pray that God may be able to melt away the ice from this blessed truth. Let it spring to life again, that the church and the people who hear may get some good out of it. And not merely say, I believe, while it is buried under the snow of inactivity and not attention. To remain a distance from the Holy Spirit is not only, it's worse than wrong, it's downright tragic. Let's go beyond the theory. Let's, if I may say, go beyond just the truth written on a page, but the truth that affects our lives. In the words of the hymn, beyond the sacred page... I seek thee, Lord. 
And that's the attitude I hope we can adopt as we enter into this study on the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. Yes, I hope you learn more, but I hope beyond that that you live more in the Spirit. As we draw our service to a close, if you would take your hymnal, turn to hymn number 391. Hymn number 391. I surrender all. This is where it begins. We can know all of the facts, but if it's not real in our lives, it's not going to make any difference at all. We're just going to sing the third verse. All to Jesus I surrender. Make me Savior, holy thine. Let me feel the Holy Spirit. Truly know that thou art mine. I'm going to challenge you. Don't sing this if you don't mean it. If you're not prepared to surrender your life to the work and the power of the Holy Spirit, don't sing it. But if you do, may this be our prayer of commitment this morning.